Welcome. You are listening to the Upper Room Podcast. For more information or to donate to this ministry, visit URFellowship.com. So good morning. We are officially kicking off Realm today. And you might ask yourself, what's Realm? Or maybe you've heard about Realm for a while now. Um, Realm is our, our new church administration software. That sounds pretty boring, um, but the, the Realm software can do a lot of things for us. It allows us to offer online giving, uh, which is great. It's going to handle children's check-in, uh, event registration, uh, all sorts of great things. But the thing I want to point us to toward, to, or toward today is Realm is a communication tool. It's a tool that can connect this community in a better way because ultimately, church isn't a place you attend, it's a place you belong. It is a community. It is built on relationships. And relationships only work with communication. So I'm excited about Realm and the the ways that it can help us communicate with each other in a more effective way. Um, And we're going to talk more about that. Bruce is going to give some instruction after, after the sermon today about Realm. But here's the big idea today. No system the church puts in place is going to just make church community happen, right? It will have to be pursued. A system can help. It can aid in that. It's a tool. But church community has to be fought for. So so I'm going to talk about church community for a bit. Then we're going to take communion together as a community. And then at the end of the service, Bruce is going to come and give us some instructions for the realm of sign up and so forth, okay? Okay, calm down. So church community... So church community, to to get to where we need to get today, we have to talk about what is probably the most difficult doctrine of our faith, and that's the doctrine of the Trinity. So we're going to start in John, and we're going to move pretty quickly, and we're going to pick it up in verse 14. So John 1, 14. If you have your Bibles, you can turn, but be quick, so I'm not going to wait for you, okay? John 1, 14 says, and it'll also be up here, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. So you'll notice that the word Word There's capitalized, right, as the name of somebody. Who are we talking about there? Jesus, right. Yeah, if you're new to church, just guess Jesus, right? 90% of the time, you'll be right. And the the word became flesh, dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. John bore witness about him and cried out, this was he of whom I said, he who comes after me ranks before me because he was before me. So this is just telling us that Jesus is not just a prophet or a teacher, but is God himself. And John the Baptist says, this Jesus who I told you about, who, although he's older than than me, came before me. He's deity. Then he says, and from his fullness, we have all received grace upon grace, for the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God. The only God who is at the Father's side, he has made him known. So this says he's Jesus, he's at the Father's side, which is, I think, kind of misses what John is trying to say here, because in the Greek, the phrase that is used here is he's at the Father's bosom, okay? So at his side versus at his bosom, those are two different ideas, right? Like, I have a lot of friends here at the church. Um, let's see, Josh, Josh Graham, he's back there, all right? Friend of mine. And I never mean, I never mind being at his side, right? Whatever that is. We have the same interests. We play basketball together. So it's, you know, watching kids play soccer, eating dinner. Who knows? Maybe we get in a fight someday. I'll be at his side, right? Never mean by being by his side. But I want no part of his bosom, (laughs) right? That's just being honest. I'm not putting him down. I mean, I'm confident he would say the same thing about me, and I'm cool with that. The phrase bosom... We don't really have an understanding of what that means in our culture. It's an ancient metaphor for part of or intimately entwined. So he's saying nobody has ever seen God the Father, but we have seen the Son. We know later in Colossians 1 that he says he is the image of the invisible God, right? So he's in the Father's bosom, which means there's, a, there's an entanglement between these two. There's this deeply intimate entanglement between God the Father and God the Son, Go to John 16, 12 through 15. We're going to read this slowly because it's a little hard to follow. So Jesus says, 
Uh, verse 12, I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. Verse 13, when the spirit of truth comes, so who's he talking about there? The Holy Spirit. He will guide you into all the truth. For he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak. And he will declare to you the things that are to come. He will glorify me, for he will take what is mine and declare it to you. All that the Father has is mine. So now we're talking about God the Father. All that the Father has is mine. Therefore I said that he, that is the Holy Spirit, will take what is mine and declare it to you. So this is just kind of this head-exploding explanation of the Trinity. All that the Father has is the Son's, and he gives it to us through the Spirit. So all that belongs to God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, and they give it to us. So one more. Turn the page over to John 17. We'll pick it up in verse 1. It says, When Jesus had spoken these words, he lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that the Son may glorify you, since you have given him authority over all flesh, to give eternal life to all whom you have given him. And this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. I glorified you on earth, having accomplished the work that you gave me to do. And now, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had with you before the world existed. So here's the picture that we get of the Trinity. Distinct, yet one. There's one God in three persons, right? And within that triune God, there's no hierarchy. We kind of have to get out of our head that God the Father has this giant golden throne and that the Son has a little golden throne that's next to his dad's. And then the Holy Spirit, he doesn't even get a throne. He just goes and does stuff, right? That's not how the Bible really teaches the Trinity to function. There's no hierarchy, but all is given and all is received. And there's this constant love and glorification of of the other occurring. So C.S. Lewis called it the dance, the dance of the Trinity, where the Father is constantly glorifying the Son, who is constantly glorifying the Father, where the Spirit is constantly glorifying the Son, so the Son might show us to the Father. And all of them give, all of them receive. No one's in debt. There's no hierarchy. This is the God of the universe. Now let's go to Genesis 1.26. It says, Then God said, Let us make man in our image. Okay, so we're in Genesis. There's no one to talk to yet, right? So he just said, let us make a man in our image. He's saying, let us, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, make a man in our image. Then he says, in our likeness, let us make him. And then it goes on to say that they made man and women, put them in a garden, told them to be fruitful and multiply, right? Chapter 2, verse 18, God makes the man and then says this. Then the Lord God said, it is not good. So that's the first time we hear those words, not good, in Scripture. Because up until this point, God makes it, and it's good. God makes it, and it's good. God makes it, and it's good. So it says, he says, it is not good that the man should be alone. So in Genesis 1, God says, let us make man in our image. Genesis 2, he makes man and says, this this is not good, as in, this is not in our image yet. The triune God of the universe perfect and in community within himself, as one yet three says, let us make man in our image. He creates a singular human being and says, it's not good for him to be alone. Why? Because God within the Trinity in and of himself is not alone. So he makes another human. This one's a little bit different. Puts him in the garden and here's the really beautiful part. They're, they're naked and they're unashamed, right? Which means that they have nothing to hide from God or each other. So at the end of Genesis 2, everything is good. Between us and God and between each other. We have right standing with God and we have right standing with one another. And this is what Hebrews would call shalom. It's awesome and it lasts about 15 seconds. In Genesis 3, sin enters into the world. So not only is there now a a schism, a chasm, what's the word? Schism? Chasm? There's a schism or chasm between us and God, but it's also going to cause problems between people. Okay, so now we're going to go to Colossians 1, verse 13. 
It says, for he, so that is God the Father, has rescued us from the dominion of darkness. So what's he mean by the dominion of darkness? The dominion of darkness is the sinful fallenness of the world where we are, we are damaged in our relationships with the Lord and our relationships with one another. So he's talking about a world we live in where we are, we're hiding and ashamed instead of naked and unashamed. So this says, for he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the son he loves, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Now he's going to get into Jesus. The son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities. All things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have the supremacy. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. So follow me. The triune God of the universe says, let us make man in our image. He creates a singular man, says it's not good, creates another human being and puts them together to create other human beings. Then sin enters into the world and damages our relationship with God and with each other. Then Colossians, as well as just the rest of the gospel, is going to tell us that through the cross of Jesus Christ, not only are we reconciled to God, but to one another as well. So the gospel The good news that Jesus died for our sins creates new hearts and new minds. And it also creates new community. The gospel of Christ reconciles us to God and one another, not as a subculture, but to be a counterculture right in the middle of culture. And the gospel community should look a specific way. Okay, Gospel community has certain nuances. I'm just going to go through like three examples of what I mean. Okay, so number one. Gospel community freely gives of itself for the good of others. Now we know this because we have been made in the image of God, and within God himself, he freely gives of himself for the good of others. This is God the Father glorifying the Son. This is the Son glorifying the Father. This is the Spirit glorifying the Son. Nobody puts anybody into debt. All freely give, all freely receive. All give of themselves for the glorification of the other. We have been made in in this image. So to be reconciled to God and to one another means that we freely give of ourselves for the good of the others. That's gospel to community. Gospel community. So to simplify it, I think it looks two ways. In gospel community, number one, we celebrate one another. Right? I celebrate your strengths. I'm not threatened by them. I'm grateful for your strengths and who God made you to be. We celebrate together as believers. We don't let jealousy lead to an overly critical spirit that erodes the foundation of our relationships. Like, let's say a man and woman join the fellowship. And they're just tremendously godly. And uh, they had the Bible memorized. And they applied all of it. They were anointed to teach. And when they did, it just, you know, the grace of God fell out of their mouths, just made me look like a schmuck. All right? Gospel community doesn't have me going, oh, no, what's going to happen to me? Right? This goes back to what Barry talked about. That is scarcity thinking. Instead, abundant mindsets and gospel community celebrates their gifts and the fact that, they, that we're better and stronger for it. Right? Like Barry said, ministry is infinite. There is no, well, I have to do this or else there's, I don't know what I'm going to do. There's no place for me. Gospel community means that you're not threatened by the gifts of others. You celebrate it because it makes us better. In gospel community, we don't judge ourselves based on others. We don't want to be the next anything. We want to be us. The gospel community, it celebrates one another. So let's use marriage as an example. Here's one of the ways that marriage really goes bad. One of the spouses will take their strengths and compare them to the other spouse's weaknesses. Right? So they go, I do this well. I do this well, I do this well. He or she doesn't do this well, doesn't do this well, doesn't do... 
You see, I deserve better. No, you're dumb, right? <laughs> you're a dumb dumb who's taking your strengths and comparing it to your spouse's weaknesses. And that's when contempt starts to move in. And contempt is the death sentence for a marriage. I'm telling you, contempt for your spouse will destroy your marriage faster than about anything. So we don't compare our strengths to our spouse's weaknesses. If you want to compare, take your weaknesses, lay them on your spouse's weaknesses, and come to realize you're both sinners in need of grace and patience. Or how about you look at your spouse's strengths? And so if you take that out of just the marriage relationship and you put it on all relationships, it means we should always be looking for strengths to encourage. We should always be able to go, man, this gal brings this to the community, and it's a beautiful gift. We should always be going, man, we, we love what this is and what you do. We love that this is what you have. Gospel community is a celebrating community. And the second way I would define how we freely give to others is not only do we celebrate one another, but we help each other in times of need. And I'm not just talking about physical needs, right? Gospel community practices the ministry of presence when people are hurting. You know what I'm talking about? I know none of you have experienced doubt or fear. I know we just memorize the Bible and sing worship songs all day, but let's pretend that doubt creeps in occasionally. Gospel community encourages the downhearted. It encourages the doubter and the fearful. And on the practical side, gospel community helps when there's a physical need. Gospel community pays the rent when the rent can't be paid. Right? That's not a metaphor. One of the things that I just love is all the babies that have been born here over the last couple of years. Right? Having a child is a, it's a real beautiful nightmare for the first couple of months. Right? It's a really beautiful, oh, isn't God good nightmare. Right? And one of the things I love about the Upper Room Fellowship community is that we are really quick to do things like make dinner for the new parents for the first few weeks. We might not make sure you sleep, but we'll make sure you eat. I love it. Gospel community freely gives of itself for the good of others. We delight in one another. We help each other when we're in need. Number two. This one will be quick. Gospel community is a community built on and walking in equality. So here's what I mean. There's no master race. There's no master culture. There's no master, so, master socioeconomic status. The beauty of the gospel community is that it is integrated at every level of existence. It means that the poor sit alongside the rich in harmony. It means that the educated walk with and know the uneducated. It means that the black, the white, the Asian, the Hispanic, all the other colors that are created when interracial couples are, couples are married walk with each other. There's no hierarchy. We see that in the Trinity. Gospel community is diverse at every level of being. Now, sometimes we don't see a ton of diversity in our church. That's because we need the community to diversify first, right? If you plant a church in a predominantly white area, you're going to have a predominantly white church, correct? So if you plant a church in a predominantly black area, you're going to have a predominantly black church. But as our community becomes more diverse, our church should also become more diverse. I'm looking forward to that. It's a beautiful thing. It's a God thing. Gospel community is built on equality. Number three. Biblical community is a community made up of men and women who do life deeply with one another. The Bible says that we should rejoice when those, with those who rejoice. Well, you can't do that unless you know them. Unless they know you. We are to mourn with those who mourn. You can't do that unless you know them and they know you. So gospel community does life deeply together. Now this last one's difficult because for whatever reason, like I said earlier, we've redefined church as somewhere you attend rather than someplace you belong. So once you switch the meaning like that, this idea of doing life deeply with one another really takes a hit. Let me show you how this messes stuff up. Look, at, look in uh, 1 Corinthians 12, verses 4 through 7. It says, There are different kinds of gifts, but the same Spirit distributes them. 
There are different kinds of service, but the same Lord. There are different kinds of working, but in all of them and in everyone, it is the same God at work. So not everybody has the same gifts, right? Not everybody has the same strengths. My wife and I like to watch the American Idol for the first two weeks because it's a real vivid example of this, right? Such a great picture of what happens when community is not honest, when community does not have love enough to go, yeah, I don't think you should try out. (laughs) It's an absolute sociological study of what happens when communities lie. Because those people were encouraged to go out there and make fools of themselves by their friends and family. Verse 7. Now to each one, the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. As individuals, we are given the manifestation of the Spirit, which means that our, our aptitudes, our natural giftings, are ignited by the Holy Spirit and begin to manifest. Like, for example, we have some excellent musicians here at the fellowship. So let's just take some of the young guitarists. You know, Josh... Michael, Rob. These guys are awesome musicians. I think if you would talk to them, none none of them picked up the guitar and says, what I would like to do with my musical ability is worship and praise God all of my days. They started playing guitar because it was cool and girls liked it. (laughs) And so they bought a cheap guitar, a Dave Matthews CD, and they were off and running. (laughs) And they all had an aptitude for it. They had natural abilities. Now, what happened is they were filled with the Holy Spirit, and the manifestation of the Spirit was that art form of music and leading praise and worship with excellence. They might not have known it when they were first learning to play bar chords. They may have just known they had some sort of knack for it. But they were given that gift from the Holy Spirit for the common good of the body of believers. You see this all over the place. Uh, You know, intellect. That's what you saw with C.S. Lewis, the manifestation of the Holy Spirit and then intellect. With others, it's art. And we could go on and on within all the domains of society. Natural aptitudes and giftings begin to make sense when the Holy Spirit ignites them. For me, I can remember most of what I read, but I lose my keys twice a week. I think it drives my wife a little crazy. She's like, yeah, I'm glad you remember how many times Julius Caesar stabbed or was, was stabbed by Brutus, but could you also remember to take the trash out on Thursdays, right? She's too nice to say that, but... So I've got this weird brain that wasn't great at school, but the Holy Spirit fills me, and now it makes sense for what I do here. And here's what the text is saying. To each one of us, the manifestation of the Spirit was given for the common good. This means that for me to be all that I need to be, that I'm going to be, I need you. And for you to be all that you are going to be, you need me. There's a variety of gifts, a variety of activities, and we need one another. And when we just attend but don't belong, we don't get those gifts that you bring. So how do we get into gospel community? I think there are some things that make it really difficult for us. The first one is our Western culture is one of busyness, right? We all know this. We value it. We exalt it. We're busy. If you don't believe me for the next 48 hours, as you say hi to everybody you know, ask them how they are, and keep score of how many answer, I'm busy. I'm slammed. I'm dying. So much to do. This is a value system of uh, ours. It's as if, if we're not busy, we're not valuable. So it's in our language and in our lifestyle. Deep community will not happen where you value busyness and doing over being with other people, period. Social networking is a supplement to relationships. It's not the replacement for them. It takes time, energy, and effort to walk in deep relationships with other men and women. And then here's the big one. If you're hiding and ashamed, intimacy is impossible. If you're hiding and ashamed... If you have not put your faith in Christ alone, reconciling you to God, and you are still trying to walk in a, a religious system of self-merit, you'll never be able to be open and honest about where you struggle and what you need. So small groups and biblical community are not, they're not synonymous. Like I said, no system the church puts in place is going to make it happen. It will have to be pursued and fought for and prioritized. 
will have to surrender and sacrifice for it. But once you get it, it's beautiful. The book of Ecclesiastes said a dozen times that to cook and eat a good dinner with good God-loving friends is a holy thing. The Bible says dinner, friends, good food, that's holy. So Julie Brammer is going to come and she's going to lead us in communion. And as we take communion, may we remember that we're not, that we are, we're reconciled to God. And in that reconciliation, we are reconciled to one another. May we delight in one another. May jealousy and criticism die at that altar so that we can care for the needs of others. May we practice and walk in equality. May we commune deeply with one another. And if you're lonely in here, if you long for this in here, you will have to take some steps. Right? People don't fall into community. They pursue it. So maybe that's a small group. Maybe that's just you gathering a couple of your friends around. We love to have over good friends and, and just do nothing, just sit and talk. And I never want to you know, paint a picture for, for you that's not reality. We don't sit around and go, well, let's discuss the Reformation and its implications. All right, everybody? Go. Right? That's not what we do. I mean, sometimes that comes up. But most of the time, we talk about our kids. We plan their arranged marriages. We <laughs> talk about dream about going on vacations together. Sometimes we talk about where we're worried. You know, maybe we'll cook something. We'll just sit around for a couple hours and talk. And it's gospel community. Because in the middle of it, maybe somebody will say, I've noticed lately you've, you seem down. Are you all right? Or in the middle of it, somebody could go, yeah, I'm worried about that for my daughter too. Let's just, can we just stop and pray? You see, gospel community is never embarrassed that it's a spiritual community. So may we want it badly enough to seek it. And may God who created us in his image Guide and empower us. Amen. Julie. You know, one of the things that Chris said was that Jesus gave his life to restore connection. The first connection that he restored was us with the Father. And the second connection that he restored was with each other. Um, in John 17, we read a lot of the verses, but later on in that chapter, Jesus prays for us, and his prayer for us is that we would be unified, and that's as a church, that we would be unified. You know, as we take communion today, in 1 Corinthians 10, this comes from the message version, um, I found it to really connect with what Chris was sharing this morning. When we drink the cup of blessing, we aren't Aren't we taking into ourselves the blood, the very life of Christ? And isn't it the same with the loaf of bread we break and eat? Don't we take into ourselves the body, the very life of Christ? Because there is one loaf. Our manyness becomes oneness. Christ doesn't become fragmented in us. Instead, we become unified in him. I love, you know, as we read the account of the Last Supper. Jesus had one cup and one loaf of bread. He took a drink from that cup and he passed that cup around to everybody. He had one loaf and he broke the pieces from that loaf and gave it to his disciples. This was community. This was how he did life with these men. These men had lived life with him for years. And this is how he wanted them to remember him. So this morning as we take communion, this is my challenge to you. We often take communion and it's all about us. It's about getting our life right with God. It's about being in the right place and, and that's important. But this morning I want to challenge you to do life through communion. As you take communion this morning, don't come up by yourself or just with your husband or wife if that's who you usually come with. Come as a community. Find someone to come and take communion with together. We have loaves up here this morning to break the bread off together. This is a symbol of us being in fellowship with one another, our commitment to share life together. We want, we value that here. As Chris shared, you heard his heart for how much we value connection in this fellowship. 
And so as we take communion this morning, find somebody to come and take communion with. Pray together. Share communion together.